Cascades, this morning we're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to be in verse 17, reading through to 22. Matthew chapter 4. I'm going to start in verse 17. This is what it says. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were cast in a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother, John. They were in the boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. That's all we're going to look at this morning. And I think um, if you were with us last week, it's helpful because it's going to kind of bleed into today's message. But the summary of what Jesus' message is has just been given to us in verse 17. When, Jesus, when it says, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. He's saying, in me, because of me, heaven is invading earth. The future is actually spilling over into the present. In me, because of me. So repent or turn around and trust and believe in me. Now, these are dramatic words. This is a very bold announcement that Jesus is making. These are words of initiative. But what I want to highlight is what's the first thing Jesus does after announcing the arrival of the kingdom of God? What is the first thing he does? If you think about what Jesus has just done, and you think about how you might think through what the next step would be, wouldn't you expect a dramatic development in world history to follow this announcement? Wouldn't it be followed by Jesus outlining a plan for how this kingdom is going to be established? We don't get an elaborate or detailed plan. We don't get dramatic actions to follow this huge and bold announcement. Instead, we get a description of Jesus just recruiting four fishermen. Four fishermen, this isn't really like a world-changing task that you might envision. For such a great grand statement, walking along the side of a lake and inviting four fishermen to follow you doesn't really seem like a big deal. It seems really simple, really small, really insignificant, very upside down. But maybe that's because we've thought about it all wrong. We need to think again. We need to think anew. See, the way Jesus establishes his kingdom is not the way our world establishes things. And the way in which this kingdom will come is not the way we expect it to. Jesus can take the smallest and most insignificant beginnings and grow them into a large worldwide movement. It's kind of like a mustard seed. It starts as the smallest of all seeds, but when it grows, it becomes the largest in a garden of plants and becomes a tree that gives shade and a place to rest for birds. It starts off tiny and small, but it grows over time. And it's in this context of his announcement that in him and because of him, the kingdom of God has come near, that Jesus is going to call his first disciples to himself. See, first Jesus calls us to repent. But then Matthew immediately follows what Jesus' is, like, uh, summary of his message is and says Jesus goes out then and calls people to follow him, to follow in his steps. And I think that actually makes a lot of sense. If the kingdom of God has come because of the arrival of Jesus, if the kingdom of God has come in the person of Jesus, it makes sense that the next step for him is to actually to call people to himself, to be with him. Come, follow me. Come, follow me. Jesus says to, this to Peter, to Andrew, to James, and John. Literally, and this is just saying, come behind me. That's what it is. Come behind me. In the first century, disciples of a rabbi were to be with, learn from, study with, and try to become like their rabbi. This was, uh, there was this common saying that disciples were expected to be covered in the dust of their rabbi because they would follow so closely behind. 
However, what's unique about what Jesus does is that his disciples don't come to him in the conventional sense. See, normally in the first century, when someone wanted to follow the rabbi, they actually decided who they would follow. They would make a decision. They would say, hey, I want to follow you, rabbi, to become like you. I want to be one of your disciples. But that's not what Jesus does. Jesus chooses his disciples. Jesus calls people to himself with authority in, which makes who he chooses that much more significant. Jesus chooses fishermen. To be a successful fisherman back then, um, you know, meant, you, meant you, you made a decent living. You weren't just poor. You weren't a peasant. You actually lived a comparatively good life relative to peasants at the time. You just didn't have that very much of a local, uh, social standing. So Jesus, in choosing fishermen, really chose very regular people. And it's not that he's against the rich. He's going to have wealthy disciples. It's not that he doesn't care or is ignoring the poor. His ministry will extend to the marginalized. But he doesn't ignore regular people either. He's cho his choosing has nothing to do with their capabilities, though. It has nothing to do with their standing, their status, their wealth, their family of origin, color of skin, education, intelligence. He chooses who he chooses because of who he is, because he loves humanity, because he created humanity and created them to know him and actually rule with him. That's what God does in Genesis 1, and it makes a lot of sense then why Jesus is proclaiming the kingdom of God has come in me. There's this restoration that needs to happen. There is no human being that Jesus doesn't love. He is God with us, the Son of God the Father, who has come to bless all of humanity with the reign of God. And he says, come, follow me. Be with me, learn with, from me, and become like me. Now, at once, Peter and Andrew follow Jesus, and immediately, Jesus, or immediately James and John also follow Jesus. And this is really stark to you and I. If you read this, you're kind of like, what the? You're just going to drop what you're doing in that moment and just follow him? Did they know Jesus already? Yeah, they did. They would have heard Jesus preach. They probably would have heard him actually teach in the synagogue. They would have known him, but they weren't his disciples yet. They would have heard his message. They had careers already, though. They were fishermen. They were ran, running their family business in the case of uh, John and James. So it wasn't like a stranger who would come up to you and say, follow me. It wasn't like that at all. I remember when I was a little kid standing outside of this complex I lived in at the time, there was a man who was sitting in his car right in front of our complex, and he called over to me and my brother, I think it was, to come here and talk to him. And immediately, like, alarm bells went off in my head, like, stranger danger. I don't know who this person is. Why are they calling me to come to their car? Everything they teach you in school, all of a sudden, it was coming to me, right? And I'm like, uh-uh. I just gave him, like, the biggest head shake possible. But then he started to talk a little more. And I started to recognize his voice. And it was actually my neighbor who lived in our complex. And he was Chilean. And if you know people from Chile, they speak Spanish very fast. Like, so fast, you, sometimes I don't even know they're speaking Spanish. So he was talking to me. I just couldn't understand what he was saying. I didn't recognize him as he sat in his car. He was someone I knew, though, but I just didn't recognize it. Jesus coming up to them, they knew him. It wasn't like a stranger coming up. There wasn't any of that going on. They knew what Jesus was about. They had heard him teach. They recognized his voice. And when he spoke, he spoke with authority an authority that they had never accounted in any other human being, an authority that many in this room have heard and recognized. When he said to you, come and follow me, learn from me, become like me. See, Jesus was affirming them and calling them. I want you to be in my company all the time. What a beautiful compliment. I want you to be with me all the time. Everywhere I go, I want you to be with me. I don't know about you, but... Knowing myself, I don't know if I'd want to always spend time with myself, if I were Jesus. But this is what he says to his disciples. In effect, I want you to be with me, to learn from me. He believed in calling them. He believed that they could actually one day be like him. See, one of the things we fail to recognize is that if Jesus chooses you and calls you to follow him, it's because he believes you can one day become like him. 
That's what he's saying by calling them. And we don't do that in our own power, of course. We are empowered through the Spirit, but that's what he believes, that we can change, that we can be transformed. Now, there's a catch, right? There's always a catch. It can't be this good, this easy. There's always a catch. What is it? Well, the catch is that there's a cost to following him. After Jesus calls them, Matthew points out, at once, Peter and Andrew left their nets and followed him. And immediately, James and John left the boat and their father and followed him. And in doing this, Matthew is pointing out that every disciple of Jesus will have to do something when they want to follow him. They will have to surrender something. It will cost them something to follow Jesus. Notice all of the leaving that gets pointed out here. Leave your nets, leave your boat, leave your father. In, this, in essence, this is leave your career, leave your family, follow me. These four had seen Jesus, they knew Jesus, now Jesus was calling them to make this costly sacrifice. And fishing, you know, we might just think of it as something like that we don't want to do as a career or whatever, but at that time in the Galilee, it was an, a significant economic industry. Successful fishermen were actually better off than peasants. They lived like a pretty decent life. And Jesus was calling these guys to lay down the security of their income to follow him. Jesus was also calling them to surrender the approval of their parents and family in order to follow him. In calling them to follow them, Jesus is saying, look, put down control. Lay down control of your plans, your career, your family. Put down your vision for your life. This is real and costly. This isn't just a really comfortable and easy thing. See, over and over again, when you read the Gospel of Matthew, you're going to be confronted with the fact that Jesus calls people to follow him, but every time he does, there's a cost. There are six times in the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus calls people to follow him, but every time there's an explicit or implicit cost. Let me read them to you. In Matthew 8, 22, there's a potential disciple who says, hey, I want to follow you, but first let me go bury my father. And Jesus responds and says this, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. This just sounds like stark to us as we hear it to our modern ears. Matthew 9, 9 tells us of of Matthew's calling. Jesus went on from there and he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. In Matthew 10, 38, Jesus says, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Matthew 16, 24 says, when Jesus, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my, my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Then Matthew 19, 22 says, Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. I mean, these sound pretty heavy, pretty stark. Matthew 19, 28, Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, this is him speaking to his 12 disciples, At the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Verse 29 says, And everyone who has left Houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. Outside of this last verse, every single one of them just highlights the cost of following Jesus, that there is a sacrifice that ends up being made. I want to be clear, this isn't a call to abandonment. You can read it like that. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. Jesus doesn't call us to abandon our families, our jobs, and everything else. Jesus doesn't call us to do that. Peter followed Jesus, but he continued to live in his own house. His mother-in-law and his wife lived there. Joseph of Arimathea was a wealthy disciple of Jesus. He didn't just give everything up and become poor. He, He still had income. And because of his wealth, he was actually able to offer something that no one else could. He offered up what was supposed to be his tomb for Jesus' body. Jesus doesn't call us to abandon everything. 
Jesus calls us to attach ourselves to him, so much so that everything else in our life, nothing else, sorry, comes close to the energy, the affection, and the time that we give to him. So this isn't about abandoning everyone. This is about attaching yourself to Jesus. And this is a call to make Jesus first. What St. Augustine would call rightly ordered loves. Rightly ordered loves, as opposed to disordered loves. See, everything has to come second to Jesus. And when he calls you, he must be the goal. When you become a disciple of Jesus, the priority of our lives becomes joining with Jesus in reaching our world with the good news of life in his kingdom. Your hands then have to be free, free to receive what Jesus has in store for you. You have to lay these things down. You can't join him if your hands are attached to these nets. He has to be prioritized over your career. He has to be prioritized over your family. And I know both of these are so challenging, but in different ways. See, in Eastern cultures, these are, this is challenging. And it's challenging in the sense that the call to prioritize Jesus over the family is really difficult. And in some evangelical circles, it's also really difficult because we've elevated that to a really high place. But in the West, our Western mindset is challenged by the call to prioritize Jesus over your career. That's really difficult. And yet perhaps the greatest call right now in our time is to prioritize him over our own desires. See, there's going to be times in our life when we follow Jesus, it means we're going to disappoint our family and those close to us because we don't live up to the expectations they have for us. And there's going to be times in our life when following Jesus means we will disappoint our employers, because we don't embrace a, embrace a culture of workaholicism. We don't embrace an ethos of just like lazy work because we reject dishonest practices. There's going to be times where we, where we disappoint those who employ us or our families. But see, making Jesus first means that we will lay down our nets. When Jesus says, drop your nets, you have to drop your nets. You can't carry them with you. Does anyone remember, like those of you who had kids, or maybe if you had a little, a little sibling who did this, uh, kids, when they were little, they would try to carry everything around with them, all in their arms? Mine did. Uh, Isaiah, when he was two years old, he would carry around all his toy trucks, and he tried to carry literally like all of them. His arms would press against his diggers and his trucks, his dump trucks, everything trying to hold them like this, and then he would try to like move, and then one would plop out. And then he would like slowly try to bend down, get it. And as he leaned forward, a bunch fell over. So then he'd get the next one, and he would just do this for like two minutes, just stuck there, trying to get everything that he could carry. Isaiah was really cute when he would do this. I mean, sometimes, honestly, it was annoying. I just wanted to get going wherever we were trying to get to. But there was something really cute about a little child doing that, right? When you and I do stuff like that, it's not very cute. It's really cute when a two-year-old does it. But when you and I do that, it just doesn't look that cute. And yet you and I easily get stuck. We get stuck. We try to carry our nets that he's called us to put down, and we're literally trying to like pull it along and tripping over it. When he says, drop them and follow me, so what are you holding on to that Jesus is calling you to put down so that you can follow him? See, this isn't just a call for someone who isn't a disciple of Jesus yet. This is a call for every single one of us. For anyone who identifies as a follower of Jesus, there's, that call still exists. So what is it? You know, sometimes it's not our family or our career. Sometimes it's an unhealthy romantic relationship. Sometimes uh, it's actually not a bad thing that Jesus is calling you to drop, but a good thing. It's just a good thing that's become a security blanket for you. It's something that's made you feel like you're safe and you put all of your hope and confidence in. And see, this is why this matters for us. 
What's at risk for you and I here is a Christianity without Jesus. Diedrich Bonhoeffer wrote, Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. It remains an abstract idea, a myth which has place, a place for the fatherhood of God, but omits Christ as the living Son of God. In other words, Christianity just stops being Christianity when you take out discipleship. You might not use those words, but see, it believes the lie that you can follow Jesus without it costing you anything. That's not how this works. See, that mentality wants the blessing of a good, gracious, and kind Heavenly Father, but it rejects the Son and the lifestyle that He calls us to. We want the goodness of the kingdom and all of its blessings, but we don't want to take the cross. And you can't have the fullness of the kingdom without the cross. It doesn't work like that. If it wasn't like that for Jesus, what makes us think, those of us who are saying, look, I'm a follower of Jesus, that, we're not gonna, that we don't have to deal with that either, that we don't have to encounter that? This is why Eugene Peterson will say, following Jesus doesn't get us where we want to go. It gets us where Jesus goes. It gets us where he goes. And somehow we've forgotten that being a follower of Jesus means that we take the way of Jesus. If it was costly for him, it'll always be costly for us. And there's, I think, a really helpful way of, of thinking of this. See, we often think of discipleship to Jesus or following Jesus in a linear sense. They're like, oh, from, we move from point A to point B. But if you know life, life never really works that way. You never really go from point A to point B. There's always something that happens that takes us off the path or whatever it is. Instead, I think discipleship to Jesus is more like a cycle where we encounter uh, a different stage, stage after stage. So this is a, a cycle of spiritual maturity, and this comes from uh, Pete Greig and... Uh, it was really helpful. There was a guy named Tyler Statton that uh, highlighted this. And so in this cycle, there's three things. There's see, sacrifice, and celebrate. In see, you have this revelation of God. You discover something new about God, and there's this invitation. Come, follow me. Come, follow me. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they didn't just know Jesus. They believed him. That message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near, they heard it and they believed it. They heard those words and believed that in Jesus, because of Jesus, the kingdom of God was coming, that heaven was invading earth, that the future was actually spilling over into the present, that Jesus was the Messiah. Why? Because they had had a revelation of Jesus. They saw Jesus. The Spirit of God moved in them. Now, they didn't have a revelation of Jesus like they knew he was divine yet. That's not going to happen yet. But they knew somehow that he was the Messiah as he was preaching this message. And they responded. You don't talk about the kingdom of God coming near unless you're making claims that you are the Messiah. So they saw, and they were willing to sacrifice for him. Now, anyone who has put their trust in Jesus has experienced this. You've seen Jesus, and you've responded to him, and you've put your trust in him. Second, though, is this sacrifice. This involves just us laying down something. This is you stripping off things that hinder you from following Jesus fully. This is laying down your nets. You hear Jesus say, you can't bring all of this with you. You can't bring all of it. I want you to follow me. Come, but you can't take all of this with you. I want you to see, though, where I'm taking you. See, discipleship to Jesus didn't make Peter, Andrew, James, and John. It didn't make them, you know, very popular. It didn't give them extra power in society. Instead, following Jesus brought them near to the marginalized, to those who were sick for many years and needed healing, to those who were considered unclean, to those who had been rejected in the temple, to those who were considered furthest from God. And for three of these four, they were martyred for their faith. Andrew and Peter, church history says, were crucified, and James was beheaded. 
John ended up being um, exiled on an island in Patmos. Here's the thing. It will cost us. There is a sacrifice. But Dallas Willard, he, he says this. He says, any sacrifice on the way of Jesus is the bargain of our lives. It is the bargain of our lives. And if you've followed Jesus for any length of time, you will have experienced sacrifice. There's just no way you can experience following him without sacrifice. The third is celebrate. On the other side of sacrifice is blessing. See, celebration is what we experience when we lay down our nets and we experience the blessing of God in our life. This is you resting on Sabbath and actually truly ceasing from work and experiencing just this sense of joy and energy as you enter into the week because you actually stopped. This is you practicing generosity and instead of experiencing fear at giving up your money, you actually experience joy as you give it away. You experience his peace knowing that he is the one who provides every good thing. See, this is you surrendering and trusting and then having him show up. He answers, so you celebrate. Tyler Stetton, he says, once we have seen something about God worth risking coming empty-handed to God, he then pours out blessing. So there's see, sacrifice, and celebrate. And so if you were to think of your journey of discipleship as this line, if anything, it's like the cycle that you just move through, where we go through this sea, and there's always something new that we learn about who God is, and yet he calls us to move forward and to sacrifice, to trust him. So where are you in this cycle? As you heard it, could you identify where you might be? Because knowing where you are right now will enable you to know what you need to do next. You'll know how to respond because you know where you are. You might be able to say, look, I don't actually need to hold on to this anymore because he's actually calling me to step into this. See, the truth is, though, that many of us get stuck. We just get stuck. We feel stuck because we really are stuck, and we haven't moved on to that next stage. And I think there's different reasons, but let me just highlight three. See, some of us are stuck because we've actually never really seen. We haven't had a revelation of God. So... We don't move forward. If that's you, you just haven't really started. You're stuck because you haven't caught this vision for who God is and what he's about. But I think for those of us who are seeking to follow Jesus, there's other reasons. One is you get stuck because you refuse to sacrifice. You catch a vision for God. You see him. You know what he's about. But You want to just bring him into your life, and your life is already packed and full of all these other things, and so you don't really have room for it. He's not really a priority. So you're unwilling to sacrifice due to your busyness or because of your fear of what it'll cost. You know what it's going to cost you, and it hurts, and it's scary. So you haven't been willing to do it, and so you're stuck. But for others, we get stuck because of disordered love. You love other things just more than him. You've seen him. You know what he's about. You know what he's calling you to. But you just love these other things more. I remember when I was in high school, I wasn't walking with Jesus, but I'm embarrassed to admit I was wearing like a gold cross chain. It's not my greatest moment. Um, I'm embarrassed more because of the way, the style that I, and all of that, right? But, and because I wasn't actually walking with him. But I remember I walked into this party and there was this, uh, a friend of mine, we're actually still friends, he's, a, uh, he, he's been involved in ministry, and he says, um, dude, you're a Christian? Me too, but I love, you know, what do you say? He said, I'm a Christian, but I love to party. I love to party. I love Jesus, but I love to party. And I think that really captures, like he was just really honest about it, just captured this disordered love that he could go and do one thing on Friday, Saturday night, but still say, yeah, but, but, but I love Jesus. In reality, he loved certain things more. Not denying that he didn't have an affection for Jesus, it's just a disordered loves, and so it shows up. And whenever there's disordered loves, it just breeds chaos in our lives. The second reason we get stuck is because 
we romanticize the sacrifice of following Jesus. This is the opposite. This is as if we always have to pick up our cross and carry it, but then we forget about the resurrection life of Jesus. The cost is all you think about, but you forget about the promise of the kingdom. These are people that you and I will respect. We respect them for being willing to make that sacrifice, but we, want, we don't want that life. It's not attractive to us because the focus is on duty but not on delight. And the third is you, we get stuck because we cling to celebration. We just cling to that celebration. This might be the most common one that we get stuck in. We get to celebration and we just try to cling to it because it just is so good. It just feels great. And we want to stay there forever. We don't want to move on from here, and so we don't. Even though there's another revelation that God has for us about who he is, about what he's about, that he wants to show us. We're just enjoying celebration so much. So we're just trying to scramble back to that stage. And yet what, what happens in that moment is we're, we're so short-sighted is that we're not actually seeing that there's another celebration to come on the other side of that vision of seeing and sacrificing, there's another one to come. What this is like is you being at a party that God is throwing, and the party's actually over. But you just haven't gotten it. You know those people who aren't always like socially aware that a party's kind of like dying out? They just stay a little bit too long. They, they just, you know, they've overstayed their welcome. You just want to keep celebrating. Meanwhile, People are cleaning, vacuuming, putting stuff away. Lights are starting to turn off, and they're just not even noticing it. We get stuck there, when we need to step through that door and enter into the next stage that God has. And here's the thing. Our discipleship to Jesus isn't just a closed circle. It's a cycle, but it's not a closed circle. And a, the effect of this cycle, if we live in it and embrace it, is transformation. It's transformation. This is what Jesus promises us. Notice what Jesus says to his disciples. He says, come follow me, and I'll send you out to fish for people. There's a promise. Yes, there's a call to follow me, to sacrifice, but there's also this promise. Jesus promises, I will make you into something you are not right now. You are not this, but you will be this. I will take your life, your past, and I will use it in a way that you could not imagine, and I will use it for a purpose you never intended. See, the promise is as you come to me, as you follow me, as you make me your greatest priority, not only will you be with me, not only will you become like me, you will actually do what I do. You will fish for people. You will serve people, you will love people, you will forgive people, you will teach people, you will pray for people, you'll pray for your enemies, you will lay down your life for people, you will preach to people. See, follow me and I will make you fishers of people. Follow me and over time, through the Spirit, you will become like me, you'll, your life will look like mine. Follow me and I promise you, you will do what I do. Come, follow me. Father in heaven, we thank you for your son Jesus and the call that he has placed on every single one of us who will hear to come and follow him. Lord, we just confess that there's so many different things in our life that can become like a net for us that we just cling to. We ask that you, your spirit would just make us aware of what those things are, even now. And we also just ask that you'd make us aware of where we are in this cycle and how you want us to respond. But we confess that many times we are too busy, we're afraid, and we love other things more. For some of us, we've actually just lost, like, we've focused so much on picking up our cross, we forgot about the resurrection life that is available in you. And yet for others of us, we have seen and we have sacrificed, but God, it's been so good in celebration that we don't want to move on. Wherever we are in this, we ask for your mercy. We ask for your grace. And then we ask that you would lead us, give us the courage and the power that we need to take that next step. And we ask this for your glory 
and our joy. In Jesus' name.